Hello and welcome to World War One and its aftermath lecture. So what sparked the war? Sarajevo on June 28th was what sparked the war. Serbian nationalist was assassinated. Who was Ar his name was Archduke Francis Ferdinand, and he was the leader of Austria-Hungary. Him and his wife were assassinated on um, during a basically during a, a parade in their country, and he has a sweet mustache. Uh, Vienna, July twenty third was the following event: Austria-Hungary invades Serbia because of the nationalists that um, killed Archduke Franz Ferdinand. In St. Petersburg, July 31st, Russia was an ally of Serbia and jumps into the fight. Um, Berlin, August 1st, Germany, um, who is Austria-Hungary's ally, declares war against Russia. And then Berlin, August 3rd, Germany declares war on France. They were an ally to Russia, and they invaded neutral Belgium because of a quicker route to Paris. Um, finally, London, August 4th, Great Britain, who was an ally to France, declares war against Germany. While listening and watching to this lecture, feel free to pause it, um, to take notes, to refer back. Um, but I'm just going to kind of keep pushing through. Here is your first anchor, um, anchor number one. You can use a shoulder partner, maybe a little brother or sister for this one, uh, maybe a parent. Using prior knowledge from last year, what were the four underlying causes of World War I? This is a good spot to pause the video and think about your answer. And we're back. So the four major causes were nationalism, imperialism, militarism, and alliances. These four causes um, were something that you should have learned in world history, whether it was a regular world history last year or an AP world history class. Okay, so the U.S. in neutrality, or the U.S. in being neutral. Um, Woodrow Wilson's response to the war was to stay out of it and claimed it's what Jefferson and Washington warned us against, but he found it difficult to protect trade with countries like Great Britain. One huge piece of warfare um, that the U.S. came in contact with, even though not even being in the war yet, was submarine warfare. Um, submarines were not utilized much before World War I, but they were a huge weapon for the Germans. British uh, had a strong naval blockade set up in the North Sea and ceased, also seized ships to pass by. So they also had a blockade, kind of like the Germans. Um, who had a, um, this submarine to protect their interests in war, what they called war zones in the English Isles. Um, the, basically what they did is if any unwanted um, invaders came through their territory, they would fire ter um, torpedoes at them, and the United States was one of them. Um, one example of this was the Luistania crisis. Luistania was a um, British... Um, you know, civilian passenger ship traveling through the Atlantic. On May 7, 1915, um, uh, the Luistana was carrying um, a few hundred different um, passengers. 128 of them were Americans. Um, these 128 Americans um, um, were killed during this. Um, Wilson warned the Germans, um, along with William Jennings Bryant, that, um, I'm sorry, he w Wilson warned the Germans that if this were to happen again, he would cut off relations with um, Germany. And this is uh, actually an act of moving towards war. It's almost like a threat to the Germans. Um, Secretary of State William Jennings Bryan did not like this, um, and he resigned from Wilson's cabinet. Other sinkings that included the Americans uh, were, there was two more, um, these, one was uh, 1915, another ship was sunk by uh, um, Germans, German subs. Um, a year later, another sub, um, this, oh, and I'm sorry, that one was called the Arabic, or Arabic, A-R-B-I-C. A year later, Germany struck another ship carrying U.S. passengers called the Sussex, um, American passengers were only mainly injured on this one. There was no fatalities. 
um, in Germany, um, basically was threatened again by the U.S., who completely cut him off. Um, and so Germany was nervous about this and vowed to not kill or strike um, any other um, U.S. ships, and this stayed true to 1917. Economic links with Britain and France. So the U.S. was in a recession before World War I started. Since the U.S. was allies with Britain and France before the war, they continued to supply war supplies, or supplies in general, to France and Great Britain. This benefited the U.S. economy. It's what also was like the main reason the U.S. wasn't neutral between, um, that remained neutral between the Central and Allied powers. Um, they would also supply things like loans to the British and the French. Um, so basically, British, the, um, Great Britain and France and their war effort um, was um, you know, making the United States a contractor and supplying money to the U.S. economy. So the U.S. economy was basically booming. Um, J.P. Morgan also helped out by um, giving loans um, to uh, you know, Great Britain and France and supplying them money at like low interest rates. Um, the U.S. looked at uh, Germans as being ferocious monsters and um, would often refer to them as Huns, as these barbaric, um, you know, old Germanic tribes of, of sorts, like um, kind of like Attila the Hun. Um, so, eth so that was something that they viewed the Germans to be, so it kind of gave a huge backing for public opinion in the United States um, in, in, in supporting the war. Um, but there were some, um, you know, Americans who were for the um, central powers, um, and these are including immigrants to the United States. Thirty percent of Americans were immigrants, and they were divided on the issue. The majority of um, Americans, though, um, sided with the Allies. Some Americans that were for the central powers were um, German immigrants who um, supported their German homeland and uh, were often looked down upon. The Great Britain really knew that it was important to shape U.S. opinion, so what they would often do is create public uh, or propaganda and feed it to the United States. Um, different posters displaying barbaric Huns um, from Germany going on and ra basically raping and pillaging um, across Europe. Um, so this helped um, U.S. Amer or Americans support the war. So the war debate, preparedness. A small group of Republicans, including Theodore Roosevelt, feared that Germany would win the war and this would overflow into the Germans coming into the United States. Um, this was only a small percentage of Americans, mainly Republicans, and um, vastly the majority of Democrat um, Americans at the time, especially in government, um, did not believe this and were in support of staying out of the war. Um, TR and others, though, convinced Wilson to pass the National Defense Act to build up the U.S. military just in case. And this scared a lot of Americans because they believed that there was no reason to build up US, the U.S. military. So opposition to the war. Many believed that building up the military would snowball into the U.S. entering the war. The election of 1916 between um, Wilson um, and Supreme Court, ex-Supreme Court Justice and New York Governor Charles Evans Hughes um, took place. TR um, rejoined the Republican Party during this time and um, abandoned the progressive slash bullnose party, which um, that party died because of it. Um, so he backed um, this um, Charles Evan Hughes for president and endorsed him. Um, Wilson's campaign slogan at the time was, he kept us out of the war, meaning World War I. Um, this slogan is what actually kind of helped him win the election, even though it was a very tight election, Wilson did win. Um, not even several months later, though, things would change for Wilson and his war effort, um, peace efforts. Wilson sent his chief foreign policy advisor, Colonel Edward House, all over Europe to nego negotiate peace. Um, a few months later, though, Wilson continued, uh, I'm sorry, Wilson continued to declare peace until January of 1917. Decision of war. Unrestricted submarine warfare. Germany tells the U.S. they will no longer keep a ceasefire when it comes to U.S. aid ships supplying the Allies. Wilson knew that war was now inevitable. 
he had no, you know, um, basically he had no choice but to enter into war because the Germany's basically saying they're going to take down the U.S. economy because the war effort is what's really supplying and helping the U.S. economy. So immediate, other immediate causes to help the decision for war was the Zimmerman telegram or the Zimmerman note. On uh, March 4th, the U.S. was given um, intelligence from um, Great Britain um, saying that they intercepted a telegram from Germany to Mexico that promised Mexico, Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico if they decided to help Germany um, invade the United States. Um, another um, reason for immediate entry into the war was the Russian Revolution. Wilson, w Wilson wasn't about being, um, he wasn't about being an ally with an autocratic Russian leader, meaning like a dict dictator in Russia. He was all about democracy. So when the Russian Revolution happened and it became a republic, he um, automatically did not have a reason to enter in with, to not enter in with the allies. Um, but a few months later in November, um, they became a communist country, so it didn't really matter anyways. Uh, declaration of war. Germans start sinking U.S. ships again. On April 2nd, 1917, U.S. goes to war, and the majority of Americans support it. And to back up a little bit, the United States was never really neutral, being that they sided with aiding the British and French for the war and um, basically cutting off um, relations or ties with Germany. Mobilization. Industry and labor. So the following programs were successful precursors to FDR's New Deal, which happened, you know, about close to 20 years or, you know, 18 years later. The following programs are Bernard Barch, or Bark, <coughs> Barak, a Wall Street broker, helps figure out a way to stabilize prices on raw materials in the United States. This is important because raw materials are going to need to be manufactured to support the war effort and if prices go up on this it's going to be very hard to manufacture expensive raw materials so they stabilize that uh, engineer herbert hoover created a program that encouraged americans to eat less wheat and meat uh, meat and wheat was very valuable in sending over to for soldiers to eat during the war effort harry garfield an academic and public official and ex-lawyer helped organize the ways to conserve energy, especially coal, by limiting the amount of use of coal for, um, you know, electricity. Treasury Secretary William McDo beefed up the railroad system in the U.S. and made it more efficient to transport goods to the East Coast to be shipped. And finally, ex-President Taft ran the War Labor Board. The labor unions were worked with and is in their wages rose and people got the opportunity to work longer hours and make more money so here's anchor number two so you're going to use a shoulder partner um, to answer this one which um, other acts in u.s history limited freedom of speech and unshared and unshared and justice holmes final decision um, and it should say assured in Justice Holmes' final decision in Schneck versus the United States. So go ahead and um, pause the video, talk about it with your little sister or brother, and then come back. Welcome back. So the, the answer to this question is, you guessed it, President John Adams signing the Alien and Sedition Acts into law in 1798. Um, this is, was protecting the U.S. from French immigrants during the naval battles with France at the time. Alien immigration was partially banned, and current immigrants could easily be deported. Jefferson quickly overturned all of these as president except the Alien Enemies Acts, Act, which deemed foreign immigrants from enemy countries dan dangerous. The act actually is still in effect today. I mean, there's a different version of it, but the core of it still stands. Um, anytime during a war ec effort, the president has, um, you know, executive power to um, limit um, the freedom of speech and um, deport anybody who deems a threat for the enemy country. Mobilization continued. So effects on American society. 
Um, there were more jobs for women, women showing their work in ethnic helped the war dramatically, or in their ethic helped the war dramatically and convinced Wilson to support eventually the 19th Amendment. Um, migration of Mexicans and African Americans. Many Mexicans came to the U.S. for work in mainly mining and agriculture. African, evolve, African Americans involvement in the industry workforce also increased. So African Americans um, went heavily into um, the uh, factories to work. And I'm going to back up a little bit because I think I, yeah, I skipped a little bit. So let's back up a little to this slide. And this is um, more of mobilization. So finance. Uh, taxes were raised on luxury consumer goods. War bonds were also encouraged to be paid for by Americans, which was basically money given directly to the war effort. Public opinion and civil liberties. Uh, George Creel led the Committee of Public Information, which gave jobs to artists, writers, and entertainers to portray the image that the war effort was patriotic and heroic. So the American Protective Leave reacts by becoming violent with German immigrants or encouraging Americans not to eat sauerkraut or listen to Beethoven. So there was an uprising against um, Germans in the country. I mean, this isn't uncommon when we look at, you know, the future World War II and, and internment, Japanese internment. Um, also to, you know, shape public opinion, you can think of um, during World War II, Captain America. Captain America was created in the newspaper to create this patriotic hero to help support the war effort. Um, the a Espionage and Sedition Acts. Espionage Act warned to imprison anyone who openly protested against the war for at least 20 years. The Sedition Act took it a step further and said anyone speaking out against the government was to be put in jail. So again, this is having to do with the previous anchor we just talked about. A major court case having to do with that anchor was Case of Schneck versus the United States. Charles Schneck basically was pa passing out pamphlets, um, warning people against the draft, the Selective Service Act, and trying to gather up enough um, movement to overturn it. But it was um, by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, he deemed it constitutional to have a limited freedom of speech during the war effort. There's the anchor. Here's mobilization continue. We went over that. Fighting the war. So naval operations. The U.S. built ships at a staggering rate and was now able to protect supply ships from German subs. Um, so now that they basically um, continued to give supplies to the French and the British, but now they were escorted by security ships and um, were pretty successful. Um, the American Expeditionary Force was a special task force um, designated by General John G. Pershing and was the first and strongest American force on the front lines. Um, you can think of it similar to um, you know, D-Day during World War II, the first drop into Europe um, during World War I. Um, they were put into the last German offensive. Um, the U.S. helped push back Germans almost immediately, and, and they drove the victory home, pushing Germany almost all the way back into Germany by November 11th, 1918, in which Germany surrenders. Making peace, the 14 points. So Wilson still insisted on peace before victory. His 14 points included permanent solutions to peace for the Allies to consider implementing at the Versailles Peace Conference. They included peaceful seas with freedom to travel, no more secret treaties, reduction of na national armaments. That means like taking down militaries or making them smaller. It's kind of like the nuclear programs of today and the world through the United Nations um, and the U.S as well as the United Nations trying to keep people from building um, nuclear weapons. The, it's also, there was the removal of trade barriers, meaning everybody can trade free, freely with whatever country they wanted, um, an organization that protected independence for all nations, no matter its size. <coughs> so this is uh, similar to the Monroe Doctrine, but on a much wider scale across the world. Um, this was uh, called Article X um, under the League of Nations. And the League of Nations is like an early model of the um, United Nations that we have today. And it came from 
this man's naughty. Um, oh, let me back up a little here. Um, the Treaty of Versailles, or the um, where the Big Four originated. Um, the Treaty of Versailles Conference is just the Peace Treaty Conference. I'm sure you guys have heard about this before from world history. The Big Four that included um, were the biggest influences at the conference, and this included Great Britain's David Lloyd George, France's um, George's Clemenceau, um, and I'm sure I'm butchering these names and I apologize, uh, Vittorio Orlando of Italy, and of course, President Woodrow Wilson. Wilson's 14 points were negotiated, but not completely kept. Peace terms. Germany was disarmed and her colonies were taken. Great war debts were to be paid pretty much completely by Germany. Independence was given to countries like Poland and Finland. Austria-Hungary was also broken up into two countries as well as several other countries. Um, this is where we also find Israel um, and the whole putting some um, you know, fuel on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and gradually giving um, Israel back to the um, Israelis and taken from the Palestinians. Um, signers of um, the Treaty of Versailles agreed to be part of the League of Nations. Article X was a part of this, which was similar to the concept of the Monroe Doctrine. If anybody at the Treaty of Versailles um, was messed with or any countries heavily messed with, with allies coming against them, um, then the League of Nations would jump in and protect them. But this wasn't completely ratified in the United States. Woodrow Wilson promised that it would, but he had to, he had to get it approved by Congress first. So uh, basically, um, Wilson came back to the United States, um, and he, he negotiated this with Congress. Um, but um, ba basically, Congress was not about, um, you know, doing this, or the majority of Congress wasn't about doing this because they questioned the whole um, Article X um, deal. So Republican Senator Henry Cabot Lodge of Massachusetts influenced many to not support the treaty. Um, this is where we have here the opponents of um, irreconcilables and reservationists. Or reservationists. Uh, Wilson's Western tour and breakdown, Wilson created a train campaign to gain supporters across the U.S. Um, to try to get the people um, to agree with Article X in the League of Nations. Um, but before he can gain a lot of support, he suffered from a major stroke and really never recovered from it. He still had about a year to two years of his presidency left, and his wife actually was the one who uh, <coughs> single-handedly um, ran the executive branch in his stead. Um, the treaty was uh, rejected by Congress. Um, the U.S. never joined the League of Nations, um, and the U.S. made peace with Germany. So making peace continued. Post-war problems, demobilization. Soldiers came back um, to the United States after World War I with no work. There was no more war to supply it. Um, the influenza epidemic broke out, causing 25% of Americans to get the uh, ammonia. Um, and 678,000 Americans died because of this. So this also contributed towards mm -hmm. you know, the United States having a small recession. Um, and basically what influenza is, is an um, infection of the lungs, which is the ammonia, deep in the lungs. Um, and it's uh, carried in birds' guts, as you may know, the most, like, that's where the flu is carried. Um, the Red Scare, Red Scare um, was orchestrated by the Palmer Raids for the most part. It's based off a series of unexplained bombings that happened in the United States, mainly in post offices. Um, and the United States just automatically blamed the Russian communists for doing it with no evidence at all. Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer, who's a picture of him right here, was sent to investigate it, but came up with virtually nothing. 500 people were deported, 6,000 arrested um, as suspects from the Palmer Raids, and it pretty much happened as quickly, or it, it was uh, dismantled, the Red Scare, as quickly um, as it happened. But later we would see this revisited during the Cold War. Labor conflict. Strikes of 1919. Many strikes took place mainly for higher pay, um, in the United States during this time. 
Um, most were peaceful, none were really successful at all. Um, race riots, um, we kind of visited this before. The Great Migration increased racial tensions in the North. Race riots erupted in Northern states. In 1919, the worst was the Chicago race riots, where 40 people were killed and 500 were injured. Uh, another thing we talked about were the severe lynchings that happened in the South and violence. Um, it was the most violent um, period in the South. And that's going to do it for this lecture. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Your notes um, will be due. Um, if you're absent, you know, you have an extra day to make that up. So just get them to me by you coming back or when you come back.